So you feel love today? Pretty much all we've been singing about here is about love. It's just great. Thank you, praise team. That was a beautiful set. Wasn't that a beautiful set? Wow. I, I'm humbled to have to follow that up. But I, I just want to start off by, by saying this. I, I know I don't say this a lot, and, and maybe sometimes it doesn't seem like it or sound like it, but I really mean this. I love you. I do. I love every one of you. You don't have to say anything back. Not that you would. I'm just going to keep it simple. It's just from me to you. I, I just want you to know that. I really do. I mean, every Sunday morning I get up and I can't wait to get here. I really mean that. Since 2011. I don't know why it's that day, but it's like the last eight years have just been like, ah. And I just thank God for you every day. Um, I want to keep it simple because that's really what this series is all about. I want to be remind all of us that... Um, God wants how we practice our faith in our life. He wants us to keep it as simple as possible. And that's why we have this series we do called Keep It Simple. This is the third of five messages in that series as well. And, and, and sometimes, I, sometimes I just think we make faith in our life just too complicated. So complicated we get to the point where we don't either practice it ourselves or we, we get confused about who we are and how we're supposed to live and how we're supposed to love, who we're supposed to love and all that stuff. In our first message, we, we talked about the simple truth, how important it is just to stick to God's word here. If you want to know about, about how you're saved, stick to God's word alone. Don't listen to what is said out there or even up here at times. Just trust what God says in here. Keep it simple, the simple truth. The second week, it was about simple prayer and about how complicated we make our prayer, don't we? I mean, we, we hear people say, oh, you have to pray a certain way with a certain number of words, you know, the, the right kind of words, you know, in the right tone, of course, and with at least two syllables for the name of God, right? I had somebody come up to me after last week's message and say, you know, I, I was praying before meals, holding my wife's hand, and I started off by saying, dear God, <laughs> my wife shot me a look. I just said, sorry, started all over. I did not... Do that sermon just to teach you how to say God more than one syllable, but to make a point that he wants us to keep it simple, to be real, to be authentic. You know, more than anything else, what God wants is he just wants us to talk to him, just to have a conversation with him. It doesn't matter how you do it, just be who you are. Be authentic, be real. Practice praying to him because, because prayer is an exercise of faith. The more we pray, the stronger we grow in our trust in God and his will for our lives. So, that's the simple prayer. Just keep it simple. Message today is the simple love. Our simple love. It's about our need to keep love simple because it is absolutely critical to God's mission through us on this earth. Absolutely critical. I don't believe there's anything more important than for, for believers in Jesus, people who call themselves disciples of Jesus Christ, to learn how to love the people God puts in our lives and to be sincere about that love. Yet it's so hard to do because we make it so complicated. Who am I supposed to love? Huh? I, you mean I'm supposed to love that person? Or, or, or that person? Or, really? And how much am I supposed to love those people? See how complicated we make it? We, we, we think that, we, we do that all the time. To teach us how to keep love simple. We got a couple passages in God's Word we're going to look at today. The first one is from the Gospel of Matthew, the 22nd chapter. You're going to hear some very, very common words here you've heard before. This is how it reads, Matthew 22. Here, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, that's one of the religious groups of, of Jewish leaders, the Pharisees got together. Sadducees and Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. All right. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replies, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like the first. Say it with me. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God. Love your neighbor. So what we have here pretty common actually to Jesus. He's being tested by his enemies, specifically the Pharisees, who always believed they were the best of the best in their obedience to God. 
That's what he's dealing with. And, they, and this Jesus is a real threat to them and to their spiritual authority over the Jewish people. So they're trying to set him up. They're setting him up with a question that he can't possibly have the right answer to. That's what this is all about. What Jesus does is he takes this very complicated question that they've thrown at him and he keeps his answer simple. Rather than selecting just one of the Ten Commandments of God and say, this is the most important, Jesus takes them all and he condenses them down to one. And his answer is this. He says, the answer to your question as to which of these is the greatest commandment of God is the law of love. Love God. Love people. Love. James calls it the royal law of love. That's what Jesus does here. And what Jesus means by this is important for us to, to break down here. He's saying, look, no matter who we are dealing with in our lives, we are called by God to love them, no matter who. Now, please note here, God does not say you have to like them. He does not say, like all people. I know some of you can't and some of you won't, right? Me included. But that's okay. He didn't say you have to like them. He says you have to love them. There's a difference, and we're going to cover that. So that's the deal. Now, when I bring that up, though, I know that some of you are sitting there thinking, yeah, but what does that mean? What, 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 still, what does that mean? Who am I supposed to love? Because I, I, I want to know. Well, some of you are thinking, well, you mean i, I, I got to love People who publicly sin all the time, yeah. yeah. You, you mean I, I, I got to love that person who cheats, cheats in golf and on his taxes and on his spouse? I got to love that person, yeah. I have to love those people who are gay? Yeah. I have to love those people who have a different political ideology? I mean, they are for the Mueller report? Or they're against the Mueller report? Yeah. Yeah, you're supposed to love them. He says, love all people. You mean I'm supposed to love even people who don't believe in Jesus? Who don't even believe there's a God? Yes. That's what Jesus is saying here. He's not breaking it down that way. He's not giving us restrictions. He says, love all people. The question that we should be asking then is how? That's a fair question. How can I do that? How can I love the people God puts in my life in the way Jesus wants me to? How can I do that? And yet still stand up for what I believe. And that's where we get mixed up. So to answer that question, we're going to look at one other passage in Scripture. And this passage reveals to us as to what gets in the way of love, all right? And what is making it so complicated is 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 12 and 13. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? God is speaking this through the Apostle Paul. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. So what we have here is God breaking it down to simplify it for us. Two kinds of people. There are people who are inside the church, meaning those who come to church who profess to be believers in Jesus Christ. That's what that means, inside the church. And then there are people outside the church, meaning people outside of faith in Jesus Christ. All right? So we have the inside, we have the outside. We're going to start with how do we love those outside. What this passage here clearly tells us is that what gets in the way of our love for people who are outside the Christian faith is this. We judge them before we even try to love them. We judge them. I want you to think about that. You, you know what I believe is the most popular sport in the world? It's not basketball, except in March. It's not football. It's not bowling. I know everybody here says bowling is. No, it's not that either. Most popular sport in the world, I believe, is people watching. How many of you would agree with that? <laughs> what else do you do at the airport? I, I remember when they first said, you got to go two hours early. I'm like, no. Now I'm going, come on, let's get there. I, I want to get three hours early so I can what? Watch people. Because what's watching people all about? Yeah, profile them. <laughs> Don't you? How many of you dream about being a TSA agent? Because yeah, you you, you you're profiling people. You, you look at everybody who comes through and, 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 and you're judging them. You know what they're wearing and, and how they look and all that. 
It's interesting. You're trying to glean whatever you can from them. You overhear them talking. Maybe you, you, you pick up on what political ideology they have, whatever it is. And you're making judgments of those people. Why? Because then you have enough information to decide if you're going to love them. What are you really deciding? Are they worthy of your love? Are they really worthy of my love or not? I am so glad God is God and I'm not. <laughs> and neither are you. Because God's love is unconditional. He just loves. And our love is so filled with conditions, it's ridiculous. You know, something I began to realize uh, just, a, just a few years ago, and I, I've shared this quite often, I'll continue to, it's, it kind of just hit me as a profound thought I hadn't thought of before. It's how strange it is for believers to expect unbelievers to act like believers. It is very strange, isn't it? For believers to expect unbelievers to act like believers, and when they don't, we judge them, right? And we say, well, then they're not worthy of our love, but that's not acting that way. Think about that. I know you don't believe in Jesus Christ, but you better start acting like you do if you want me to love you. <laughs> Where's the logic in that? There isn't any when you think about it, just self-serving. It doesn't make any sense. It's filled with conditions. When you look at the life of Jesus, he was sitting and eating with sinners all the time and getting criticized for it, but he never blamed unbelievers for acting like unbelievers. He just knew that's who they were. He didn't confront them for how they lived. He confronted them for their belief or unbelief, but not for how they lived their lives. Look, the, the world out there is crazy. <laughs> it is. But it's people acting like they're of the world. That, that's, that's the reality that we live in as Christians. Sometimes I think we feel like we're on an island, <laughs> and sometimes we are. But Jesus says we are to live in the world but not be of it. What we're, what we're experiencing is people living who are of the world. But God says to us that we are still to live in the world but not be of it. We are to offer an alternative to the people of this world other than what the world has to offer. And that alternative is not a place or, or, or people who judge but a place and people who love. Because that's what people need. Everybody needs to be loved. Our number one job as disciples of Jesus is to evangelize. Evangelize comes from a Greek word, oiangelion, which means the gospel. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. That is what we are supposed to be doing, to share the gospel of Jesus with all the people we can who God puts in our lives. How do we do that? First, by loving them, and then by leading them to know Jesus. But it has to start with love. You can't start by pointing your finger at their sin. That is a horrible evangelism strategy. Don't do it. It will not work. Many of you know Pastor Paul Munch. Um, I just talked to Andrew the other day because his wife, because, uh, because Paul was in the hospital, is having a heart condition. Uh, it was after playing strenuous basketball, so he needs to lighten up a little bit. So if you call him, you can tell him that. But he is going to be getting a pacemaker and his insurance. Anyway, he had to go home. But I, I promised Andrew we would keep him and his family in our prayers, and, and they're doing great. Benjamin is, is as well. But he told me this. He said, you know, being a mission pastor and just real experience at it, he, he's the one who revealed to me, he says, do you know how missionaries do it? And many of you have heard this before. When they go out to the mission field, they don't start pointing out the sin of the people. No, rather they open up the scriptures, they open up the word of God and point to the sacrifice of Jesus, saying, you don't have to sacrifice anything anymore because you see, that's the natural uh, reaction that people have. They go, there has to be a God and therefore I have to get right with God, so what do I sacrifice to God? That's the thinking of people who are outside the Christian faith, who've never heard of Jesus before. So these missionaries, they don't point to the sin, they point to the sacrifice made for their sin. They love them. And then lead them to Jesus Christ as their Savior. People do not line up to be judged. They line up to be loved. 
we just make loving people so complicated. Now, I want you to understand something, though, as I'm saying this, because I know some thoughts are probably going through your mind. I am not, and don't let anybody else do this, don't equate loving someone with condoning someone's behavior. They are not the same thing. You can love someone without condoning their sin. I'm just saying I don't have the right to demand someone without faith in Jesus as their Savior to live a life that looks like they do have faith. That are according to my expectations or even according to God's expectations because God's expectations about how we are to live our lives is not for unbelievers, it's for believers. That's why he speaks to us in the way he does through his word. And the reality is there are times and circumstances when I need, when, when we all need to alter our expectations of those who believe differently than we do. That's hard to do. Because you know what's easy? Pointing the finger. It's really easy to point the finger at people, the finger of judgment. But God says, be careful of that. How's the old saying go, Matt? Because look how many are pointing back at you. <laughs> right? You point the finger at someone else, and they're all pointing back. This is where it needs to start if we're going to be pointing everything. God says, be careful. That's what he means by this verse in, in Corinthians. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church, he says? God will do the judging. And then he goes on to say, are you not to judge those inside for what? For our sin. Let's go there, shall we? Inside. How many of you like to confront people? Anybody here like to confront people? The owner, don't raise your hand. Anybody else? Anybody <laughs> like to confront people? Okay. Not, not many. Okay. Maybe two here. Okay. Confronting is really, really hard. Look, if you, if you really think that confronting people is a thing to do, then after the service, I, oh, pause. Look around. Look around you. You're not just at the person next to you. But look around you. Find someone you have a problem with, that they have a sin in their life that is just bugging you, and you are going to confront them right after this worship service. <laughs> well, why not? What do you think you're going to hear if you call them out? Thank you so much for confronting me. I was just waiting for someone to notice and then confront me like that. <laughs> I seriously doubt it. No, probably what you're going to hear is, oh, yeah, there's the pot calling the kettle black. <laughs> right? Who are you to judge me? Well, you better take that log out of your own eye first. That's why it's difficult. <laughs> yeah, doesn't that sound like fun? I can't wait till I get to confront again. And that's what stops most of us from confronting others of their sin. And yet God tells us to. That's what keeps us from speaking the truth in love, from holding people accountable as God is calling us to do. It is hard, but it is necessary. That's why we need each other. You know, whenever I tell someone that they need to confront a situation involving someone else, <laughs> you know what I usually hear? Well, that's easy for you, Pastor. You like to confront. No, I don't. <laughs> I just can't sleep if I don't. <laughs> I feel like I have to confront. I mean, think about it. If, if, I, if I hear or see a church leader not walking their, their, their talk, or, or if a friend of mine or a member of the congregation isn't living a, 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 a good witness in their life, I have to confront and expect to be confronted if that is true of me too. Why? Because I want to? No, because we have to. Because God says so. Judge those inside the church. Why? Because God is a God of love. He's a God of love. And he wants you and me to love people as he does. And to do that, we first have to love God. You know, Melody, when you were singing, you were pointing to the cross of, of Jesus. and That's our prize, the empty cross. He's the one who died for us. I shared this at first service. When, I, uh, when I'm confronted by a situation where um, I feel harmed by someone or hurt by someone, uh, I... I really, and Leona can tell you, I do this too. I, I go right to the picture of Jesus on the cross, looking down at the people and in the condition he was in. And yet he said, Father, forgive them, 
for they know not what they do. And I'm thinking, man, if I could do that for people. So I'm asking you today to do that for others. But here's what we need to do for ourselves. Flip the picture around. Look up to the cross and see Jesus saying that to you. Look up to the cross and realize that in and of ourselves, we're not worthy of what he's doing on that cross. He gave his life for you. God wants us to know that. Did you hear those songs? Oh, how he loves me so. That's how much he loves you. Picture yourself at the foot of the cross and Jesus saying, I love you because he does. (coughs) And when he rose from that grave, he said, that's how much I love you because you're going to live forever with me. Now you got work to do. And what's the work? Love. Love him and love the people he puts in our lives. God's love looks like this. Love people outside the church. How? Unconditionally. Let God do the judging. When it comes to inside the church, love people inside the church unconditionally. Absolutely. But confront and love. Confront the sin that affects the witness of their life. You know, either inside or outside, they both have to do really with confrontation. Because when we talk to people outside the church, God is asking our lives to confront the unbelief of people. Inside the church, confront the life of people. In my opinion, confrontation gets a bad rap. <laughs> it's, it's really a good thing. It's just, it's just hard to do because we make it too complicated. And I know we're in a society with a philosophy of tolerance of, of everyone for anything and everything. That's, that's kind of how this world is wired right now. But inside the Christian church, the greatest act of love we can show for each other is to hold each other accountable to living a life that gives praise to God, being a good witness that will give God the glory he deserves. You know, just a bit ago, Vicar Stephen led us in our confession. In 1 John 1, 8 and 9, God himself speaks to us. He says, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But when we confess our sins, God remains faithful to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, before we can love people outside or inside the church, it begins with us knowing how much God loves us. And no matter what we've done in our lives, it just doesn't matter. He loves you enough to have died on that cross to forgive you and give you the promise of eternal life. That's love. And that is the love he wants us to take outside of ourselves. We are called by God that regardless of belief or practice, we are to love the people he puts in our lives. That's his truth. You know, sometimes I I, I think God is wanting us to experience life in this difficult world so we can practice, so we can learn to love people in the way that he wants us to. He wants us to practice learning to love. I tell you what, not many people expect us to love them who are outside the church, I say we surprise them. And we just love them anyway. It's not condoning. It's loving. You know, sometimes we draw this demarcation, and we need to, between between God's children. There are God's children over the entire earth. Every single human being is a child of God because God is the creator of all, right? Psalm 139. He knits us together in, in, in the mother's womb. God is the creator of life. He's the father of all. But then there are kids of the kingdom, all right? Like we just saw in our baptism of Madison, standing up here as as kids of the kingdom. We are children of God too. So we got to make sure we know what we're talking about, but never forget that every single human being we see is a child of God's. And God wants them to know his love for them. And he wants us to be the ones to show them that love. But keep it simple. 
You know, sometimes we mix this up. Love is, is, is not a feeling, right? It's not a feeling, it's an action. It's being intentional and purposeful in doing an act of love for others. I call it seeing and meeting the needs of other people. You know what I'm talking about? Like we have all kinds of different ministries here. We, 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 we provide Hill Country Community Ministries with food. and We don't say, oh, by the way, make sure they're believers first. No, we don't do that. We pray that as, as they receive gifts to survive in this life, they look beyond the hand that feeds them and see the face of God. That's, that's how that should work. We don't just drive people to appointments, doctor's appointments, because they're believers. <laughs> we do because we love them. And we want them to see God's love through us. One of the best phrases I ever heard was by Pastor Alberto from Costa Rica. When he said this, he said, if you have no food on your table, you have a material problem. But if your neighbor has no food on their table, what kind of problem do they have? They got a spiritual problem then because we're not taking care of their physical need. That's a spiritual problem for us. Keep it simple. I'm going to close this out um, by reading something to you I, I found, and I thought it was really cool. It's, it meant a lot to me when I first read it. and um, It was titled The Simple Love, and so it's about a six-year-old boy. A six-year-old boy whose 10-year-old dog had to be euthanized. And this kind of hit home for me because we took Tika to uh, the vet yesterday, not to be euthanized, <laughs> but she's got some issues. And, and, but as I was waiting for the doctor and stuff, they lit a candle on the counter, which means somebody was grieving their pet right at that moment. And it just it tore me up it tore, because they just know the love I have for my dog. Well, so the mom was trying to comfort the boy by just talking and talking and talking. And she said, oh, it's, it's so sad um, that uh, dogs live a shorter life than humans. I wonder why. And this little six-year-old boy says, I know why. People are born so that they can learn to live a good life, learn to love everybody all the time. Dogs already know how to do that. How many of you believe that? They do. They're the only just creatures in the world. I mean, along with other animals, they're just doing what, what, what they're made to do. And he goes on to say, so they don't have to stay for as long as we do. I thought, what a profound way to, to look at it, though. And so the, in the same article that I read, it said, just think for a moment. If we could learn, if we could, could, could learn what dogs already know, listen, when our loved ones come home, always run to greet them. Wouldn't that be cool? All right. Run, romp, and play daily. How many of you do that? David, I know you do. I follow your Facebook. Yeah. How about take naps? <laughs> Thrive on attention and let people touch you. Avoid biting. <laughs> when a simple growl will do. <laughs> when you're happy, dance around and wag your entire body. Let's all do that. <laughs> Never mind. <Okay. laughs> Delight in the simple joy of a long walk. Wow. Outside in God's creation. Be faithful. Be faithful. Never pretend to be something you're not. If what you want lies buried, dig until you find it. When someone's having a bad day, be silent. Sit close by and nuzzle them gently to let them know you love them. And if you poop on someone's life, clean it up. <laughs> I just made that one up. It, it, it was just my way of saying, you know what? As you love, have fun. And keep it simple like Jesus does, in his name, amen. Please pray with me. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for how simple you have made everything for us, especially salvation. It's all about you doing what you came to do. Didn't have to do that, but you did out of love for us. 
May any of us here today who struggle with that, may we just, just find that place and time, that mountaintop experience where we can envision us sitting at the base of the cross and you telling us how much you love us. We know you do, God. Grow us in our acceptance of that love so that we can indeed share your love with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join me as we pray the prayer Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever.